Can you tell me a little bit about what you know of the massive history of the ragged schools? Very, very little, really. Um, I picked up things from here. One of our volunteers turned up one day with 40 pages of A4 and said, you might like to make a brochure of that. It finished up as a book called Ragged Schools, Ragged Children. Okay. She was actually a curator at the Science Museum at the time, but it was quite helpful. Unfortunately, it's out of print at the moment. She's got a useful little bibliography in there. Again, every reference is only a sentence or a, a paragraph. So it's a matter of doing a jigsaw with all sorts of little bits of information. There was a ragged school south of the river. And soon after we, soon after I started, we kept getting lorry loads of building materials. Not us, Governor. They, they were rebuilding a, what used to be a ragged school somewhere in South London. But now, I don't know about you, but if I order something, I'd like to put an address on so it gets delivered to the right place. No, I went down to Portsmouth a while ago. No one around at the time, but uh, he started, I think, in the late 1700s, uh, John Pounds. They'd started in odd places, you know, not one person, but he's obviously the most famous. Um, so you might have six in this area, but none in that area, because it was down to individuals. And the general thing, of course, was a tradesman with children in his workshop on a Sunday. Um, Bernardo was quite unusual. Um, when he came over from Ireland to train at the London Hospital, he was helping somebody else's ragged school in Ernest Street. Within a year, he's made superintendent, so he's obviously a bright lad. So what does he do? Starts his own, so he's very independent as well. That's, of course, Dr. Bernardo of Bernardo's charity that exists today, yeah? Yes. Oh, right. They've dropped the doctor some time ago, but he, there was a tribunal that said he was entitled to use the name because he went up to Edinburgh in 1873 and took a degree up there. Because you see, the, the significance of that is if you send begging letters to the people in big houses and you're a mister, a letter doesn't get past the maid. If you're a doctor, the master of the house would read it. Some people said it's bringing the gutter into the drawing room, but that did help me get some money. But he started on ragged sword in Ernest Street. I'm deliberately vague because there's so much bombing in this area. Yeah. Uh, for example, that park was eight streets into the wall. That way, that was a gas works, and that was there till about 10 years ago. So there's nothing you can see. The street where Bernardo started, Hope Place, World's End, disappeared many years ago. Yeah. So there's nothing at all to see apart from a plaque on a Chinese takeaway, I believe it is now, which is not quite what Bernardo had in the time. There's a picture of it just over here. So how long have you been working at the Ragged School Museum here? Only since 1991. That's just down there. But as I say, there's nothing to see apart from a plaque on. Um, that soon got overcrowded because he was pretty efficient. I'm not sure at which stage he started to feed them, but uh, that was the big draw. So he started another Ragged School in Salmon Lane just down the road. Again, they got overcrowded. Then these two buildings became available. By the way, these three buildings were totally separate originally. Warehouses. So you'd have a door there, a door at the front, and no connection. Oh, you can't see it here, but in that building, you can see a, a mark where there was a hatch for the ladder to go up to from the basement to the top floor. That was the only access inside. But once Bernardo had these buildings, he, that was a solid wall there, and you put stone staircase <coughs> in each of these two buildings, and that was the only access between the buildings. And this was Dr. Bernardo that ran this? Yes, this right? was, um, they were built in 1872 as warehouses. He got these two in 1876, and it was 1877 before he moved the kids in. That and fireplaces, staircases, fireplaces, and windows in the back instead of the doorways. So, I mean, you can see the size of this room. I don't know if you noticed, the building slopes back quite steeply. Yeah. Um, the end building, you can't really see anywhere because there's things been built on each floor to get an idea of the size. But that building is probably twice the size of that in this one at the moment. Sorry, on the ground floor. But um, that's the basic museum. And as I say, that building is huge. 
because we're treating the canal and road. And so, so the triangle just tapers down to nothing that happened. Tell me more, uh, more about the, the histories that have grabbed you. What tickled you about the histories of the ragged schools? Then? Well, I got involved because my next door neighbour was the treasurer. They'd had a VAT bill for £25,000. And at the time, I was a taxation manager at Touche Ross. Got that sorted out. And then I threw my job in and came here voluntarily. It's, it's a marvellous history. Yes, yeah, so you see, in 1983, all these buildings were going to be knocked down. And our founder discovered that this was the last one connected with Bernardo. Got it listed, did bits to this part of the, of the rest of the building, but got this in a condition where we could allow, allow the public in. A bit of a problem at the start. The safety people said, you've got to put concrete floors in for fire safety. Historic buildings people said, you can't. So there's one saying yes and one saying no. So it's quite a, a battle. I mean, you could see it's taken 140 years to wear the boards like that. So it, it is part of the history of the building. And they tried to do this to reflect the old feel of the original floorboards. What they had to do is, these are nine inches deep, had to put battens up and down, screw fire retardant boards up, paint the rest of fire retardant paint, just to keep the original feel. When we got it, there's this green paint everywhere. And our founder discovered these were the colours that Bernardo specified, so he had to get written approval to go back to what it was originally. So Dr Bernardo, he even had it in mind which colours he wanted for the space. Yeah. It was... Fairly normal, because kids were dirty, that didn't show the dirt, but that reflected what light there was. And the alarming thing is the lighting. This drawing shows the gas pipe flared off, flickery, smoky. So, of course, from the ground up, there's maroonish brown. They'll cover all the, yes, the, got... the mucky hands. And... Well, I mean, most public buildings were painted one colour or another, mainly for that reason, I think. You know, people say, well, are these bars to keep the kids in? No, they were on the building when he got them, and it would cost money to take them off, so they just stayed. So, so tell, tell me more about the man himself. We've had quite a number of Bernardo boys here, and there's two common strands. One, that they weren't strictly orphans. One parent still survived, but they couldn't look after all six kids, so three went into Bernardo's. Apparently 40% of Bernardo's kids were not strictly orphaned, but they were destitute. The other strand is that compared with other orphanages they'd been in, Bernardo's was like a holiday camp, and at least two people said those words. So, but the others have got the same impression. We've only had one Bernardo's girl here, and she was in her 80s. She'd been placed with a family when she was young. A neighbour complained to Bernardo's that the lady of the house was going out every evening drinking, leaving the girl alone in the house. So Bernardo took her back and put her with another family. See, people today say, oh, he shouldn't have done that, he shouldn't have done this. What he did at the time was thought to be best for the kids. You know, there's this furore at the moment about um, people being emigrated and abused, but some were treated as members of the family. We had a chap from Canada. If you worked on the land for five years, you were entitled to buy land for pennies. And he had, he was very well to do. Others inherited the family farm, as it were. So they were a lot abused, but um, Bernardo was quite punctilious in this country because he could get a letter full length of the country and back again in a day. So he could do something about any problems here. But the problem was he had to rely on the people in Canada, Australia and so on. And it took weeks to get information one way. And then, of course, it takes the same time to get the information the other way. Just before I forget, your, your name is Bryn... Brian. Brian, sorry. Sorry, I've been known as Bryn for the last 40 <laughs> years. We had four Brians in the same office, and I'd just come back from Wales. I said, oh, call me Bryn, and it's stuck. So, yeah, well, I, I like to, because these are oral histories, really, I like to, to make sure that we, we can, well, okay, so it's Brian... Freer. Freer. Right. I must admit, most of it is secondhand, but people have told us, which is nice. Mm. Um, you know, people coming here and, well, we had one lady who worked here when she was 14 on the sewing machines. And what we'd done at the time is put the sewing machines that were left in this building in 1983 in the room over there as a temporary ma measure. And I took up the stone staircases there. And as we came up, she said, oh, it's just like it used to be. So you got six and six a week. All the machines were run by one motor with a belt and pulley. If your belt came off, you had to get it back on while it was still going. Never mind cutting your fingers off, but don't bleed on the material. But it's nice that someone's come back 66 years later to tell us about working here. And odd little bits, like I heard one man talking to his daughter in here. He pointed to the door through there and said, Oh, I remember. When my mum worked here, that was where our crash was. A crash. We quite go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But as I say, it's it's a like a jigsaw, little bits of information from this one and that one, all that confirms it, all that. Oh, we didn't know that bit. Have you managed to piece together an idea of what a day was like? What? what? No. <laughs> right. Um, you see, the school was closed in 1908, despite what the kids say. I wasn't here then. 
Are you Victorian, <laughs> Mister? Uh, not quite. Well, obviously, you got them. Uh, you know, there, there was some work element. But the funny thing is, we have ghost hunters here some nights, and somebody has invented a wicked janitor, the ghost of a wicked janitor. Oh. Now, that doesn't strike me as being one hundred percent kosher because. A, there wasn't the money to employ anyone. It's all right, you boy, you clean that bit, or you girls clean that. So a janitor, not so sure. Apart from which, as I say, Bernardo was quite benign, and he was concerned how the kids were treated. I've been talking to an academic who's been studying the ragged schools for Strange. She's been quite clear, uh, Laura Mayer, her, her name is, that many of the ragged schools were very progressive it all depended on the individual in charge of that particular setup. I mean, Bernardo's organisation was amazing. Um, he finished up with orphanages all over the country, public speaking. He was 60 when he died, but I reckon he wore himself out. I mean, that was quite a respectable age at that time. Are his letters preserved or any of his writings? Did he write? I don't know. Bernardo's have a fantastic archive, but um, whether that's personal or otherwise, I don't know. I did gather that a few years ago there was a a male and a female Dr. Bernardo somewhere around, but I think they've retired now. And I can never work out how many generations it is. There's, because you can have 20 years between the youngest and oldest child in some families. We had, one day we had two men in, one who said his father came to this ragged school, and the other said his grandfather came to this ragged school. Um, when his father came here, I thought, hang on, that can't be. But when he told me how old he was, he was about 20 years older than he looked. When you hear people talking, are these fond memories then? On the whole, the only niggle I've heard is from a lady who knew somebody who knew somebody else. So it was sort of at least third hand. And you know how these things get uh, magnified or Chinese whispers? Just after I started, a man came in in his 70s. He said, oh, he was a Bernardo's boy. In fact, they've just been to see him, so they keep in, they kept in touch. So, you know, I, I don't know very much about it. It's just sort of little bits here and there. That's the thing about this history. It's so big and it's so fragmented. I got the impression after the, the Forster Education Act, when the government bankrolled and absorbed the, the ragged schools infrastructure, the history starts to, to go into decline because from, from that moment onwards, it was taken for granted. Maybe there's a better phrase there, but it was now a part of the infrastructure of the country. See, Bernardo's overlapped this period. Sorry, Bernardo started. He later formed a company, I think, which we had to do because owning a building in a partnership, if you add or lose somebody in that partnership, you have to sell the building. In theory, you've sold the building to a new partner. So uh, I think he must have formed a company quite early on, just a few years after he started. Because I had something from Bernardo's a while ago that gave one date and another thing that gave another date. And you mentioned the Shaftesbury Society and the Ragged Schools Union. Can you talk a, a little bit about that? I don't know very much about them at all. Formed in 1843. I think to coordinate all these odd individuals and groups that were running ragged schools with an aim to pressuring the government to get official approval for local authorities to open schools. It still took them until 1870 to do that. So uh, I think that there's a rumour that the churches were a problem. They were, you know, we've got to have control and our lot save more souls than your lot. So there's the usual uh, politics. But people say, did they use the word ragged school? Well, there's a copy of the magazine. And that Bible shows the name of Shaftesbury Society and Ragged School Union. So now you, you, you work very hard to let the public know about this important history, yeah? It's a little embarrassing. About six months ago, I was telling someone about Bernardo's. <clears throat> it turns out he was the CEO of Bernardo's. He got this tiny badge <laughs> with a, a logo on it. Couldn't really work out what it was. I said, I, afterwards, I, I said, I, I think I've been teaching my grandmother to suck eggs. <laughs> he said, it's all right, you did it very well. And as I say, people do have a go at Bernardo's. I'm sure I need another cup. Oh, here comes Erica. No, I say most of it is from odd little bits of information. Erica's the one with the records and whatever. We didn't inherit anything here. 